Last year, I made an animation for the Kinetic Rush Challenge, and I was planning to do a breakdown of how I use Cascader for it, but honestly, I didn't feel great about the result. Especially the double cork, I just couldn't get the auto physics to work with the twist. And that kind of stuck with me, so I wanted to test whether it's actually that hard to get complex twists working with auto physics, or if I was just doing something wrong. To test that, I tried animating a snapu swipe, which is another trick with uh, complex rotation because there is a sudden change in the rotation speed after the roundhouse kick so I expected auto physics to struggle here again but weirdly enough it just worked first try. Now I was curious why did auto physics work for this but not for the cork. That's what I want to explore in this video what made the difference and how to get twisting moves to work with auto physics without spending hours trying to fight the tool and actually use it to our advantage. So how does auto physics work? More specifically the physics corrector which is the main part of the auto physics. One thing that's super important is that the fulcrum points are detected correctly. I don't want to go too deep into that here since there is already a great guide on it. I will link it in the top right corner. All we need to know for now is what the different colors above the timeline mean. Green means that there are many fulcrum points and the character is stable, for example standing on both legs. Yellow means that there are still fulcrum points but only a few and in close proximity, for example standing on one leg. And orange means that there are no fulcrum points, so the character is jumping or falling most likely. Based on this, the physics corrector will try to make the animation physically accurate by adjusting the position and rotation of the center of mass on every frame. So if the section is green or yellow, the character should be in balance, more or less. I imagine it kind of like the fulcrum points are locked and the center of mass will be moved to have a smooth and balanced motion and balanced poses. But when there aren't any fulcrum points, so during a jump or a fall, the center of mass follows a ballistic curve or ballistic trajectory. That means that the height of the jump depends on how long the airtime is and of course on the gravity too, but we will keep that on default. The body will keep its rotation during the jump, since in the air there is nothing to stop at the motion. So the only thing that matters in the air is what the pose of the character is. And this is really important, so in the air the exact position and rotation of the character or the center of mass doesn't matter. You can move or rotate the character any way you want and it will still land at the exact same location and rotation. Well, you can force it with prior frames but I will talk about them later. So now that we know how auto physics handles the movement especially in the air it's time to talk about what actually causes the movement in the first place. Just like in real life, everything depends on the setup. That's the part that decides how the body is going to move once it's in the air. And honestly, that was my biggest mistake with the first animation. I didn't really use reference. I found that watching tutorials and not just people doing the move really helps because they often break down the mechanics in a clearer way and really watch how the body moves right before the takeoff. Let's take the cork as an example. You can think of it as an off-axis flip with a twist along the axis of the body. So we want to figure out what causes that to happen. So there are basically three parts for this. First of all, the height of the jump, which comes mostly from the leg that's pushing off the ground. It's pretty straightforward, but there is a great comparison made by Yozuke or Johannes Antila, if I pronounce that correctly. You can see that on the left, the the leg doesn't fully straighten for the jump and the cork will be lower compared to the right. The swinging of the leg and the arms also help with lifting up the body but the main force comes from the pushing leg. But in Cascader the height is based on how long the character is in the air so this part doesn't matter as much for auto physics but it's still important for the overall result. The second part is the flip that comes from swinging the kicking leg 
up, but also with the arms and the upper body moving backwards in sync with the leg. And the inversion of the flip is also controlled by the kicking leg and more importantly, the upper body how it leans and where the arms are pulling. In my original animation, the kick was almost vertical and the upper body was moving straight back, which made Autophysics interpret it as a more vertical flip, even though my blocking suggested otherwise. If I wanted to keep a flatter cork, I should have angled the last kicking pose more towards the left shoulder and the upper body should follow this direction also. And lastly, the twist comes from also the upper body and the arms, and it only starts right before the takeoff. And once the character is airborne, the arms and legs come together from an open pose to almost a straight line, kind of like in a snap swipe animation, but I think it's more subtle here. And after the setup, you only really need keyframes in the air where there is a change in the pose. In the snap swipe, there is a kicking pose and a really tight twisting pose, and those are the two main extremes. I also added anticipation and overshoot for the kick to make it clearer, but don't overcomplicate the blocking. But for the cork, it's even simpler. You just need to get into the twisting pose and hold it and only before the landing open up to slow down the rotation or the twisting. And that leads to my second mistake that I made in the first animation. I tried to do all the twisting manually before turning on auto physics. So I ended up keyframing every 180 rotation or so. It's not that this doesn't work, you can do it this way, but it makes the animation way harder to manage and honestly it's just a huge waste of time in my opinion. But it's actually pretty tough to get the exact rotation and flip you need right before the jump. And that's where priority frames come in. If there is a pose you really want to hit exactly, you can mark it as a priority frame. Then Autophysics will try to make the physics work while keeping the frame as close as possible to how you blocked it. You do lose a bit of physical accuracy when you do this, but that's usually not a big deal. And you can even set multiple priority frames if needed, but keep Keep in mind that the more you add, the slower the calculation gets and you get less physical accuracy. So it's best to use them only when necessary and only add one or two. I will set a single priority frame around the middle of the jump and by adjusting the rotation of the center of mass, I can control the flip angle or the inversion. And for controlling the twist, it's better to use local space by rotating the center of mass closer or further away from the starting pose, I can influence how fast the character spins. That way I don't have to rely on changing the actual pose just to control the twisting speed. With a few small tweaks, we ended up with a lot more control over the animation, and here is how it compares to the original one. If there is one takeaway from all this, it's to use a reference, and I mean really analyze it. In my case, that's what made the difference for the second trick. Autophysics won't fix bad animation and bad poses, but once you understand how it works, it becomes a really powerful tool. You will no longer have to fight it and it will speed up your workflow a lot. But if it doesn't work for the first time, don't stress about it, step back, look at the setup, go back to your reference and try to learn from your mistakes.